it's time to start diving into node modules. We can't build everything ourselves from scratch, right? We want to reuse code that's been done before and focus just on the features that make our application unique. If I'm building a web server for a website on ice cream, I'm not interested in the fine details of how the HTTP protocol works and how my computer represents data in bits and bytes. That's not really relevant to ice cream. The thing that's going to make my website unique isn't going to be the way it makes HTTP requests. It's the way that I present information about my favorite ice cream. So Node allows you to reuse code, like ways to make HTTP requests using Node modules, which we can also use to break down and organize our code into smaller, more manageable files. Remember when we talked about the Node built-ins? One of these was the require function. Node adds a built-in function called require that's not part of vanilla JavaScript. This function just takes a JavaScript file, executes it, and then returns the code from that file so that we can reuse it elsewhere. We can require any of the default built-in modules. For example, the HTTP module or the events module by passing in the name of the module as a string. And like we've seen, we generally assign the result from our require function to a variable, almost always a constant that represents the value returned from that module. We're able to require modules that are built in like with the events module or modules that we build ourselves. And we can use require to take advantage of third-party modules, which are modules built and shared by other developers. We're going to explore each of these possibilities. So let's get into it. Welcome back. What can we do with the built-in modules? We have all of this functionality that we see here in the Node documentation built into Node, including working with the file system, encryption, and HTTP. We're going to do an example using the HTTP module to browse the web. We'll see what we can do using just the power of built-in Node functionality. Let's try to duplicate what happens when we visit google.com in our browser. We're going to build out this HTTP example.js and we'll start by doing the most important thing, which is requiring the HTTP module. And we'll assign it to a constant, HTTP, which we're going to use to make a request against Google servers. Now, the require function has set the HTTP constant to the set of functions and data that are returned from the HTTP module. And one of these functions is the request function, which we can call using HTTP.request. And we can see that it takes a string, a URL, or a request options object as its first argument, and a callback as the second argument. This is a convention that we'll see throughout Node, where the callback is the last argument that we pass into an asynchronous function. First, we'll pass in the data, which will be the URL of the Google homepage google.com and the second argument will be a callback that accepts a 
response object when it's called. Which means our callback function using our arrow syntax will look like response and then the body of our function. The response passed into our callback is the result of making the request that we just specified. And the way we get data back from our response is by calling the on function which takes the name of an event as a string and then a listener as a callback. Does this remind you of something? Check it out! We've already bumped into a real-life example of the event emitter in action. Very, very cool, and there's way more where that came from. So the event that we're going to be responding to is called data. And the data event has a parameter for a chunk of data returned by that event. So we can try logging the data that we just got back, and we'll use a template string to say data chunk is the chunk. A chunk is just a piece of data. That's not necessarily the whole of the response. We could receive more than one of these data events if the size of the response from our server is very large. And the fact that we can get more than one of these events makes it a perfect use case for the event emitter. Our response here is, among other things, an event emitter. And one of the other events that it can emit is the end event which is sent when there's no more data coming in from the request. It doesn't have any parameters, and we'll just say no more data to make sure that we're getting this event. And our request has completed. Now, before we try this out, we're going to need to do something with the response result of this function call. So we'll access it by first saving it to a constant that we'll call the request. And now we'll need to call request.end. We always need to do this because the end function will cause the request to be sent. Let me show you what I mean. So I'll comment out the end call and see what happens when we execute this program. Calling node http example.js. And I got this error that says invalid URL on the www.google.com address. This is because I didn't include the http in front of the address. Our library needs to know which protocol we're using. And as we'll see in a second, it's very sensitive to using the correct one. Okay, so now that we've added the HTTP protocol, let's see if our program works. I'm going to clear the console and run it again. And I'm waiting here, but nothing's happening. This is because I didn't trigger the request to be sent by calling the end function. So I'm going to exit out of my program, uncomment the end, and hopefully this time it works. Let's see. That looks like the HTML to the Google homepage to me. We've got Google search showing up as well as our HTML tags. And when we finished getting the data from Google, we got our no more data event and our log over here. So that works. But what happens if we want it to be really secure and use the HTTPS protocol to get our data from Google? Remember, HTTPS 
keeps the data encrypted when it's being sent between our machine and Google servers so that no one can snoop on our data or change it unexpectedly. So I'll save my file and try running it again. But I got this invalid protocol error this time. This is because our HTTP module doesn't match up with our use of HTTPS. When we want to be secure, we need to use the HTTPS module in combination with an HTTPS URL. Node uses this separate module when communicating securely. And it has a similar series of functions to the HTTP module with the additional functionality for secure communication. So now when we run our program, we get the response from Google, but it's been decrypted by Node. Now, you might have noticed that we are always using the request function from the HTTP module. In cases like this, when we know exactly what we're using, it's a good idea to use this modern ECMAScript syntax to destructure the object that we get back from our require call. This looks something like using the curly braces and passing in the name of what's in that object that we're using. So in this case, we're saying we're going to be using the request function. And now the request function doesn't need to be prefixed by the HTTP dot. This is very helpful in knowing exactly what functionality we're relying on from each of our modules. So I suggest doing it whenever possible. And it makes it easy to switch if, say, we wanted to replace our function with a different one. The HTTP and HTTPS modules include a convenience function that's called get, which does the same thing that request does when we're only getting data from the server and not sending any data in its direction. The benefit here is that we no longer need to call the end function. It's called directly by get. So I'll remove that. And now I can get rid of our request variable. Let's see if things still work. Very nice. What we're doing is just like loading the Google homepage in our browser, except unlike the browser, we're not rendering the HTML that we have here on our screen. Just a little difference between our application and the Chrome browser, right? Nothing too major. All right, we're off to a good start. Remember, we built this using purely built-in node functionality. We didn't have to install or download anything other than the node runtime. But we're just getting started. Let's keep it going. I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back. So why do we use modules? What benefits does learning about them give us? Well, a module is just like a box. This box contains some code, which is dedicated to doing one thing well. And so we label the box with a name like HTTP.js, which corresponds to the name of our module. We combine these modules with each other to create more complex structures, which all together make up our program that relies on all of these modules working together to achieve our goal. I've broken down why we might want to use modules into three main reasons. The first is one that we've already seen, 
which is that we want to reuse existing code and not reinvent things that have already been proven to work. We want to spend our time building what's important to us and what makes our application unique. Modules allow us to package existing code into these reusable chunks. The second reason is that modules help us organize our code. And the third related reason is that they expose only the functionality that will be used by other modules and hide details that only matter within that module. Let's explore these two reasons a little bit further. So say we're looking at an HTTP module, which we want to use to make requests against the server and receive some data back in a response. Well, there's many different things that the HTTP module might do, but we know for sure that it's going to deal with requests and responses. And so that's how we might break down our modules with a request and response.js. Each of these can be self-contained, doing just what's relevant for that part of the process. So storing only the data that's required by the response and responding to events that we'll be getting back through that response. Our HTTP module will want to make use of both of these building blocks. But we don't necessarily need to know the details of how the response reads in data from the server or how the request packages up our data to be transmitted over the internet. These are implementation details that are relevant within the module, but not really relevant to HTTP.js. At this layer, we only care that we are getting back some data and that we can transmit some data. So we load those modules and make use of their capabilities, but those lower level details remain hidden, which then simplifies our top level. Our HTTP module is now only concerned with how it uses response and request objects to do higher level operations, rather than worrying about irrelevant details. All right, with that, let's move on to the next video. Welcome back. We've used an existing module, HTTP, written by the authors of Node.js. But can we write our own modules and organize our own code? Of course. Let's do it. I've created a modules example folder. And together with you, I'm going to try to figure out the structure of the HTTP module. In fact, let's do the HTTPS module. In Node, each file is treated as a separate module. So I'll start by creating a new file called HTTPS.js for the top level module. And let's say I want to make a function which allows me to make a request against some server to send it some data. And this function will take a URL for the destination that we're making the request against, as well as some data to send that destination. And it's going to return the response. Now, say I wanted to break out the details of the request and the response into separate files. I would create a response.js as well as a request.js. And the key for our request is a function that allows us to send it to a URL and passing in some data 
And remember, this is HTTPS, which is an encrypted connection. So we're going to need a function that encrypts our data. And it returns the encrypted data. So for now, let's just say that it takes this data and returns the encrypted version. So our send function is going to take the data and encrypt it. And then send it to the URL of our server. So we're just going to say sending, let's use our template string here, encrypted data to URL. And in our response, we're going to need a function which reads in the response and returns the data that we get back, which of course needs to be decrypted because it's been encrypted by the server to keep our data private. Now, obviously, this isn't a real read function, and we're not actually decrypting any data. For that, we'd probably use a library that implements TLS, which is the protocol that our browsers and servers use when sending encrypted data over the web. But what we're interested in here is the structure. And with our functions that we've created, we can create a skeleton of this request function, where we want to send the request to our URL, passing in the data, and then read in the response, returning it from that function. But now, how do we actually use the send and read functions from our request and response modules. Right now, we don't have access to these functions because functions and variables in a module are private to that module, meaning that we can't access them from other modules. That is, unless we export them first. And the way we do this is using the module keyword. Module is a global built-in that contains data related to the current module. So for example, if I do console.log inside this module and I run node request.js, you can see that this entire module object was printed, including things like the path where the module lives in my module examples folder, the file name, whether it's been loaded or not, but also this exports object. This object is what we need to set so that it includes all of the functions and variables that we want to be available in other modules. And we can do this by doing module.exports equals an object containing a function called send, which will set to the send function. And since we want to export the function with the same name that it already has, we can use the shorthand syntax of just saying that we're exporting sent. Now inside of HTTP.js, we can use our require function to create a request constant that we set to our required module. And what we pass into our function 
will still be a string, but it will be prefixed with a dot slash, followed by the path of the module. So in this case, we're looking to require request dot js. The dot slash here just means that we're looking in the current folder for a local module that we've written ourselves called request.js. The dot represents the current folder. And altogether, our string is called a relative path. If we were looking at a parent folder, so say we had a folder called public, and our HTTPS module was in that folder, we would rename our string and use two dots, which represent the parent folder. So in this case, request is one level up from HTTPS. And you can see here that my code editor has made that change for me without me having to do anything. But depending on what you're using, you might need to be careful to make sure that you're looking at the right folder. Okay, but we're not going to use the public folder right now. So I'm going to move my HTTPS file back to the original folder and I'll delete this. Notice that my file path has been updated back to the dot. And we can actually remove this .js extension because the require function by default looks for JavaScript files with the .js extension. This is set on the global require object. So if I go to my node REPL and I look at what require.extensions is, we can see that Node has set the require function to look for JavaScript files first, if there's no extension in our path over here. And if it doesn't find a .js file, it'll look for a JSON file. And finally, this binary.node file, which is an advanced feature where you can write a add-on in C++ and import it as a node module. So for all other extensions, so for these extensions, we would need to include the extension in our require statement. Okay, so let's do the same thing for our other module. In response.js, I'm going to set module.exports at the bottom of the file here to the read function. Notice that for both modules, we've set up the example so that there's a function that we want to export and one that is only really relevant within that module. How the data is encrypted and decrypted is not something that the HTTPS module needs to worry about. We only care about the public interface for the modules that we're using. So now I can create a response using the response module. And when I call my functions, I will call them using the correct constant. So request.send and response.read. Let's test this out. I'm gonna make a request to HTTPS google.com passing in hello. And in my terminal, I'm going to execute the HTTPS.js module. And it looks like I got an error. I've called my request function the same as my request module. 
So I'm going to need to rename this to say make request and call that. Okay, let's try again. Looks like our response isn't coming in because we're not logging the value that we get back from our function. So what I'll do is set it to response data and log that. Okay, third tries the charm. There we go. Our modules are being loaded. The code in them is being executed and certain functions exported to be then used by the module here that we're running from Node. Okay, let's take a quick break and I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back. There's a few different ways that you might see modules being exported. We can set our module.exports object all in one step and say that we even had a constant like say the timeout where if after 500 milliseconds the request doesn't complete, it gets aborted. And we wanted to share that with our other modules. We could add that to our exports just like that. But we could also set the properties on the module.exports object directly by assigning them. So say we did module.exports.send equals our function and module.exports.requestTimeout equals 500 milliseconds. This would work as well. And Node even gives us a shorthand syntax where we don't need to include the module keyword and we can instead just set the exports object directly. Exports here is just pointing to module.exports. And say we only had one function that we're exporting. Our module.exports could point directly to our function. So now this function is all that we're exporting from our module. And this changes how we access our function. Now our response over here is a function. So we could set it to read directly. And when we call it, we would just call the read function. This should still work. My recommendation is if you have a choice to stick with the version that we started out with, which was using the module.exports object and putting it at the bottom of the file. When you do this, it's clear what the interface to your module will be and how it will be accessed. When you're reading your code, you only have to look in one spot rather than searching for references throughout your file. Another thing that we could do, if I move my response module back to how it was, is when importing these modules to be clear about what I'm using. Notice that in https.js, I'm not using the request timeout. So I should be clear by using this destructuring syntax that I'm only using the send function. And likewise for the read function in the response. So this is now setting the read constant to the read property returned from our response module. This change lets me 
call these functions directly. There we go. Now this is starting to look like a clean node program. I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back. The modules that we've seen so far have been what's called common JS modules, which is a standard for modules that was created back in 2009. More or less when Node.js started. CommonJS is mostly known for being used in Node, but it's also used in a few other server-side technologies, like the popular database MongoDB. When we use the require function, we're using CommonJS. The other major standard for modules competing with CommonJS is ECMAScript modules, which are part of the ECMAScript specification that is the main standard for the JavaScript language. And it's followed as much as possible by your browser. And for example, the V8 JavaScript engine that Node uses. ECMAScript introduced its own modules in ECMAScript 6 or ES6. So you might hear these modules called ES6 modules or ESM for short. Rather than using the require function, these modules, if we look at the Mozilla developer documentation, under the import statement, if we scroll down, we can see that rather than using require, we call import from, and then the name of our module. If you've done a lot of JavaScript front-end work, you've probably seen this import statement. Likewise, for exports, scrolling down here, rather than using the module.exports object, we use the export keyword. We'll learn more and see this in action because finally, starting from version 13.2, Node.js began supporting ECMAScript modules in addition to common JS. This is great for maintaining one context when building projects where you have a backend and frontend and you're switching back and forth. With changes like this, it brings you one step closer to just having one language in mind and potentially even sharing code between front-end and back-end modules. In Node, you'll mostly see CommonJS, but as time goes by, adoption of ES6 modules will get more common, and so you might see them more. But the vast majority of Node code has been written with require and CommonJS, and that will continue. So what you want to be focusing on and what we're going to be using in this course is CommonJS. But in case you're interested in making your own or using existing ES6 modules, we can learn a lot by comparing with CommonJS. Let's give this a go in the next video. I'll see you then. Welcome back. How would we write our modules example if we wanted to use ECMAScript modules? We need to replace our require function calls with import statements and our module.exports object with an export statement. The way this looks is actually quite similar. Rather than assigning a constant, we call import 
And rather than calling require and doing this assignment, we remove that and write from. We also don't need these parentheses, but we do keep the path of our module. And that's what an import statement looks like. Something to be aware of when using common JS modules and the require statement, you might hear import used as a synonym for require. That is, you might hear, hey there, I'm importing the express module, or hey there, I'm requiring the express module. You might hear either version. So it's good to make sure you're clear about which type of module you're working with, if there's any doubt. All right, we'll do the same thing for both. And now we can use the send and read functions that are being exported from our modules, this time as ECMAScript 6 modules. Now in our response.js, we'll replace our module.exports with a call to export, leaving everything else exactly the same. And we'll do the same in both files. Now we can try to see what happens if we run our module through Node. we get an error that says that we cannot use an import statement outside a module when we try to import our send function from the request module. And scrolling up further, we see this warning that tells us that to load an ES module, we need to set type module in the package JSON which is something that we're going to be exploring, or that we need to use the .mjs extension. You see, Node treats JavaScript files as common JS modules by default for backwards compatibility. Node has been using common JS since it was created. You need to explicitly tell it to treat your code as an ECMAScript module by naming the file with the MJS extension, where the M is for module. So let's make that change. We need to rename each of our modules from .js to .mjs. There's one more change we need to make. If we go to the Node documentation under ECMAScript modules, and we go to the terminology section, we can see that for relative paths, like when we're using the dot slash or dot dot slash for the parent or current directories, the file extension is always necessary when importing the file. Unlike with require where the file extension is assumed to be .js in the majority of cases, with import, it's a good idea to use the extension, which is going to be .mjs. Let's make the change in our HTTP.MJS file. This is what our import needs to look like. You might see some code bases that don't require that extension. For example, if you're using some kind of compiler that handles that extension for you. But in general, it's a good idea to use the file extension for better compatibility. If we're already making the change to ECMAScript modules, which brings our code closer to 
how things work in the browser, we should follow the same conventions for using the full name of the file, including the extension. This way, your modules are more likely to be compatible with browsers, but also with other JavaScript runtimes, such as Dino, which always uses the full path or URL to the file that you're importing. With these changes, we can now run our code and we have to be careful to run https.mjs this time. There you have it. Node using ECMAScript modules. That wasn't too bad, right? All right, I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back. When we load a module, whether it's in CommonJS using the require function or an ECMAScript module using the import syntax, Node caches that module. Let's explore what that means. Say our request.js file, in addition to having all of these assignments and functions, had some code that executes whenever it's loaded. So say we had a console.log here that just said, hello from request.js. Now, what happens when we run our program? Well, the first message we get is hello from request.js, which makes sense. We're calling require on requests before we call any of our functions, before we start making our request. But what happens if I call the require function more than once? on that same module. Say I made a mistake here, or I just split up my statement and I imported the request timeout separately, rather than putting it all on one line. If I run this program, what do you expect the output to be? Pause the video and take a moment to think about it. You may be expecting that our message in request.js is printed twice, once for each time the module was loaded. But if we actually execute our code, and I'm going to clear my terminal here, you see that we still get our message, but it's only ever executed once. Why is this? Well, in larger programs, it's very likely that we might have modules that are required in multiple different places. So if we had a module for just HTTP without the encryption and the security that HTTPS gives us, we might still require our request module and use it throughout that file. It's likely that some of our modules will be loaded in, required, in multiple different spots. And so, in order to be efficient and to prevent behavior that's part of that module from being run over and over again, Node maintains a cache of required modules, which is basically a little database of these modules that Node checks to see if a module like request was previously loaded. And if it already was loaded, it doesn't load it again. It just looks up the module in that cache. This way, the code in our module only ever has to be run once. After that, it's already in memory. And the require function will always look the module up in the cache if it's already there. This cache is global, 
and it lives under this require.cache object, which we can print to see what it contains. After requiring our modules, we can scroll up and see that the cache has all of our modules, including their path, any exports they have, and also whether they've been loaded or not. So in this case, the HTTPS module hasn't been loaded by the require function because, well, HTTPS is the module that we're running. It's the one that's loading all of our other modules, which we can see below. For our request module, we now expect to see the object that is being exported, which is then returned from our require function, and also that scrolling past this parent, that it's been loaded. And this parent is just a reference to the module that is doing the loading of our request module. And we expect to see the same thing for our response. There's our response module with just the one function being exported. And we can see that it has been loaded. This require.cache object isn't something we'll be working with very often, at least not directly. But we can see that the internals of Node aren't magic. Node is using this require built-in module and its cache object to implement our CommonJS module functionality. Oh, and by the way, you can't edit a required module. Say in my http.js file, I tried to reassign request.send to my own function that just logs custom send function. This is something that first time node developers often try to do. And all it does is that it sets the send function within this module to be the custom function. So if I did request.send here, and I tried to run node http.js, I do get the custom send function, but if I called request.send in https.js, it's still calling the original function that is in our require cache, the function that was originally exported from our module. We now have a solid understanding of the node module system. Let's keep this in mind as we build our node applications. With that, I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back. When working with node projects, you might come across a file called index.js. Let's explore exactly what this file means and how it might affect us. Say we wanted to organize our example a little bit more, and we wanted to create a folder, say internals, inside of our modules example. And this folder was for the request and response modules, which have to do with the internal representation of how the HTTPS module works. What would happen if we tried to require that internals folder? Say by doing require and then passing in the path of that folder. As it stands, this wouldn't work. Internals isn't a module that require can load. 
but we can make this work. And the way to do this is to use index.js and creating a file with that name inside of the internals folder. Index.js is a special case in Node. It allows you to treat a folder like a module so that when you pass the path to a folder to the require function, it resolves to the index.js file inside of that folder. Let's see this in action. The index file will export, just like we've been doing, an object that contains the data we want to export from this folder. So we're going to have request, which is going to point to the loaded request module, which we can do by saying request is equal to require and passing in the path of our module. Now, when the path to the request module is passed into require, the return value is this object that we set to be exported. And that object can now be accessed using the request property that's being exported from index.js. So now when we import this in http.js, we can call for our request module internals.request to access the request timeout and send function. This would look like internals.request.send. And we could do the same thing for our response, calling it in the exact same way. internals.response.read. Now if I execute the module, everything works. Index.js is a special case that allows you to export functions from many different modules that live in a single folder from a single point, which can then be referenced using the name of that folder or the path to that folder. This way, when you import your files, you don't need to target the individual modules in your directory, looking up the specific paths. The developer just specifies one time what is being exported, and then every time it's imported, you just point to the folder containing those modules. Now, we could be really fancy here and say we wanted to export the functions directly from index.js. Say we had request and response and we wanted to export request dot send as send and request timeout from the request module as well as read from the response module. And we wanted to do this so that in our HTTP module we could call internals.send and internals.read directly. Or using our destructuring syntax, we could destructure those two functions from our internals folder.
this way as the person importing from the module. You don't need to worry about the internal structure of where the send and read functions come from. So you'll often see this kind of pattern with index.js. And sometimes if you're being really, really fancy, you could do this same code by using the spread operator. So we could, instead of setting everything manually, we could do module.exports equals the request module as well as the response module which we spread using these three dots. And we don't need these separate imports now. This spread operator takes all of the properties in our two modules and it unpacks them so that the same properties with the same names exist on our new object here without us having to do it for every single property like we did before. So we could test this out and there we go. Now, don't worry if this seems a little bit too much for just a simple export. You might prefer doing the long form version of this. Being more explicit like we did on top here. And you might prefer not using index.js at all. But the important thing that we've learned is that we can use this feature of Node to import groups of modules that are grouped in a folder with an index.js file telling us what is being exported from that folder. All right, on to the next video. Welcome back. Should you use index.js in your projects or should you not? That is the question. This is a controversial subject among Node developers. Some love it for its ability to simplify imports and make it easier to use complicated modules with dozens of files. And some developers will suggest that you always use the direct path to your module, not relying on any special behavior in Node. Through all my experiences working with Node, I've generally learned to prefer not to use index.js for most projects. It's good to understand in case you see it, but it might add some unexpected confusion. If we look at the Node documentation for how the require function finds the module that you specified, it's actually quite complicated. We've already seen that there's different behavior for built-in modules, where you just pass in the name of that module versus modules that we've written ourselves, which begin with the dot slash or dot dot slash. And index.js adds on to this logic. We can see that there's a section here for loading the index. It adds another special case to this already fairly long logic. It might not seem like such a big deal, but it's actually one of Ryan Dahl, the creator of Node, one of his 10 regrets about Node.js, which he presented at this large JavaScript conference in 2018. In his own words, it needlessly complicated the module loading system that we've been talking about in this section. Now, to be clear, 
Ryan, in this talk, wasn't saying that Node.js was a mistake. It's more a reflection of what he might have done differently. Looking back on the past 10 years at the time, in hindsight, one of those things was index.js and the complex logic that we saw just a second ago around how require loads modules. The good news is that we don't have to use index.js. We can keep things really simple. If you can avoid a few of these little missteps, which I'll make sure to point out to you, Node becomes this really, really amazing tool. Now, it's not the end of the world if you use index.js in your projects. I've used it on a few, and things turned out just great. But it's one of those things that over time you learn to be careful with. Because of the potential for this added confusion among developers. I hope this can be helpful if you ever come across a debate about whether using index.js is more helpful or more harmful. You can now reference reliable sources like Ryan Dahl's talk and the Node.js documentation over here, which I'll link to from this video, to talk about index.js and potentially the complexity that it might add. With this additional knowledge, we can take one step closer to being senior node developers with an understanding for some of these little quirks in Node.js. All right, I'll see you in the next one.